So what do you guys think about that holding call in the last two minutes? If you're an Eagles fan, you're pretty pissed off, right? Look kind of, you have no idea what I'm talking about, just let it go. But if you're an Eagles fan, that was the moment that essentially ended the game for you. Because mm -hmm. now, now, while people are still coming in, I just remind you, know, if you don't have a group, find one. If you haven't picked a company, pick one. So times are moving. We're into week three of the class. Um, so once you pick a company, if you can put it down in that master list, it's not fixed and, you know, it's not etched in stone. If you want to change it, you're welcome to. But this is just to make sure you can get started because if you don't pick, you cannot get started. If you cannot get started, it won't stick. Nothing, nothing in this class will stick unless you actually do it. You know, it's one of the natures of, of a craft, right? I, you can watch me make souffle. I'm not good at making souffle, but you, if you did, now you, you still need to make your own souffle before you can, you know, before you figure out what needs to be done. So today's class is going to be about equity risk premiums. And I'll set the stage. The equity risk premium is the price of risk in the equity market. It's what you're charging over and above the risk-free asset to buy equities as a class. Let me repeat that. This has nothing to do with your company. So you can't ask, what's the equity risk premium for Coca-Cola? It's really an equity risk premium reflects the price of risk in the market. It's a market set number. And I'll, today I'm going to talk about how most people estimate it and why I don't like the way they do it. But to set the stage, for that discussion. I'm gonna to come to you with a few very simple choices, okay? So you're gonna be my guinea pig. Let's assume I come to you with an investment where I guarantee you a dollar every year in perpetuity, guarantee. How much would you pay for that investment? Give me a number. Five bucks? I'm probably not gonna sell you the investment. It's a guaranteed investment. If you paid five bucks, what are you earning as a rate of return guaranteed? You pay $5, you get $1 every year, you're gonna make a 20% return. I'd love to get it for five, but my guess is if I open this up to a bidding war, it's going to go to eight to 10. And I can pretty much tell you where it's going to end, right? What's the price I'm probably gonna end up with? If it's a, US, it's a US dollar guaranteed investment, roughly speaking, where am I gonna end up at? About 30, which would be the inverse of the T-bond rate right? Because you're going to end up roughly there because that's what you can make on a guaranteed long-term investment. So that's the starting point. Now I'm going to come to you. You said 30 for that guaranteed investment. Let's assume it's a dollar a year still, but it's not guaranteed. It's an expected cash flow from equities collectively. You said 10. Glad you picked that. So that's a 10% expected return. Have you told me what your equity risk premium is when you did that? Absolutely, right? 10% minus the 3.3% or whatever you had, that's your equity risk premium. Now, if I ask you, what's your equity risk premium? You can make up numbers. Here's the problem with asking people, what would you like to make? I'd like to make 15% premiums. But if you price stocks to make 4% premiums, guess what ends up dominating? It's what you pay that matters, not what you say. Sounds mysterious, but I'm going to argue that the best way to get equity risk premiums is not look at the past, not look at what people tell you they want, but to actually look at what they pay. Because as you have lower premiums, you're going to pay higher prices. If you get scared, you're going to lower the price. In fact, let's take that. Let's assume that we build on that premise that this price tells you what your risk premium is. There are studies that show that as people get older, they get more risk averse because one of the reasons you pick 10% is implicitly your risk averse. If we weren't risk averse, you know what I would pay for that $1 uncertain cash flow? Exactly what I paid for a risk free investment. The essence of risk aversion is expected cash flow is expected cash flow. We don't adjust for risk. As human beings, I don't think any of us have reached that stage of enlightenment or stupidity, depending on which way you look at it. That's why we charge a premium because we're risk averse. And the more risk averse you are, the larger the premium going to charge. So studies show consistently that as people get older, they get more risk averse. Lots of different reasons, right? One is you know what can go wrong and that kind of scars you. 
Second is you have responsibilities, your family. So basically, as you get older, you get more risk averse. I'm going to build on this premise. If you look at an equity market, it's composed of investors. And the demographics of those investors can change over time. In fact, if you look at Japan, you look at parts of Europe, even China right now, you have a demographic problem coming into play, which is the populations are getting older for lots of different reasons. So I want you to take that to the next step. If investors are getting older, what should happen to equity risk premiums in that market? They should grow, which means stock prices holding all its constant will be under downward pressure. Doesn't mean they'll go down tomorrow or day after, but in markets with aging investor bases, you're going to see higher risk premiums than you did before, even if nothing else changes. So your equity risk premiums are going to be a function of how risk averse you are. And that risk aversion can be affected by the demographics of the market. It can even be affected by events. Let's assume I told you that there's been a crisis. I take the example that I gave you. The crisis can be a market crisis, a 30% meltdown, an economic crisis, a political crisis. You're willing to pay me $10 for that $1 investment? Would you pay less or more off you know, once this word of crisis hits you? That's because you're scared, right? That's what we do. That's the only thing we have in our hands. So when you get scared, what do you do? You push down prices. Why do you do that? Because you want to earn a high return. Why? Not because you're greedy, but because you're scared. So let me make a statement about equity risk premiums. And let's see if we can come up with a way of measuring risk premiums that reflects it. Equity risk premiums in real life are unstable, and unpredictable, they will change over time. Which means any approach to estimating equity risk premiums you have has to be dynamic. You can't have an equity risk premium that says 5%, 5% all through a year when crazy things, remember 2020 when the whole world shut down? You definitely don't want an equity risk premium measure that stays fixed over time. It has to reflect the world you live in. So for the moment, that sounds mysterious, but as we go through the different approaches to estimating equity risk premiums, I wanted to judge that approach based on, is it dynamic? Is it capturing what's going on right now? So let's go back to, I think we were on page 46 of our notes. Let's talk about the equity risk premium. Here's the way most appraisers, most investment banks, most consultants get an equity risk premium. They look backwards at what? The history of returns you'd have earned on stocks and something risk-free. So let's take the US market. I actually update historical risk premiums on my website, even though I never use them, I update them because I know other people for whatever reason are fixated on them. I go all the way back to 1928. Already you can see that I'm starting with a market, a US market, very different from today's market. 1928 was the year before the Great Depression. Very different, much narrower market. But if you want history, you have no choice, right? You have to go back in time. And I compute equity risk premiums for the US from the historical data. Notice I said, use the plural, equity. Because I can estimate very different premiums depending on the slice of history I look at. I could go all the way back to 1928. I could go back 50 years. I could go back 10 years. I could go back five years. And each choice is going to give me a different number. So when people are, you know, tell you there's a historical equity risk premium and act like it's a fact, stop. Because it's, it's not a fact. It's an estimation effect. Second, it depends on what I define as risk-free. I could use T-bills, which are short-term governments or T-bonds, which are long-term, I get different equity risk premiums. It even depends on how I compute my averages. See, what does that even mean? If I take 94 years of history, an arithmetic average, I take 94 years, I add them up, divide by 94, that's an arithmetic average. A compounded or a geometric average looks at what you started with and what you ended with and looks at what you made over time on a, on a compounded average basis. Do you remember enough of your statistics? If I gave you an arithmetic average and a geometric average on a number, will the two ever be the same? Or what has to be true for the two to be the same? 
you can have zero standard deviation. In other words, you make 9% every year, which, which goes against everything we know about equity. If there's, un, if there's a standard deviation of volatility in your returns, your geometric average numbers are going to be lower, but they're going to reflect the truth much better, right? If you're ever confused about arithmetic or geometric averages, let me give you a very simplistic example. Let's assume two years ago, you invested in a stock at $100. Last year, it doubled. So what was your percentage return last year? 100%, right? This year, it halved. What's your percentage return this year? Minus 50%. Through the magic of averaging, you know what your average return was over the two years, right? 100 minus 50 divided by two is 25% a year. But what was your stock price at the start? 100, you ended at 100. You made no money. But I'm saying, don't trust your eyes. You really made 25% a year. Arithmetic averages are extremely misleading with stocks because of the swings you get up and down. So if you look at those choices, you can see you get very different risk creams ranging from 4% to 13% depending on how you compute. And we tend to forget statistics when we do these numbers. Remember in statistics, if you take 100 numbers and you compute an average, you're trained to put in brackets below that average, how uncertain you are, right? A standard error. See these numbers in italics? Those are the standard errors in your historical risk premium estimates. Let me repeat that again. Those are the standard errors. In your, so when I tell you that the equity risk premium for the last 94 years is 5.06%, that looks incredibly precise, right? Second decimal point. And then I said, oh, by the way, the standard error in that number is 2.15%. Do you remember enough statistics to develop a range around that number? With 95% confidence, what do you do? Plus or minus two standard errors. Plus or minus two times 2.15% means the true equity risk premium in the US can be somewhere between one and 9% as if that helps you in any way. And if you go to 10 year averages, you might as well have told me absolutely nothing. It's all noise. A historical risk premium over the last 10, 15, 20 years is nice to know, but it's so noisy that it's useless as a, as a forward looking number. But let's say you're willing to overlook that. Are you making another assumption when you use historical risk premiums? Assuming that you can overlook the statistics. What else are you assuming when you use a historical risk premium as your proxy for forecasting future premiums? In other words, you're assuming mean reversion, which is a fancy way of saying things will revert back to the way they used to be. So what's a period we're looking at? 1928 through 2022, right? So we think the world is going to go back to the way it was between nine. The bulk of that period is in the 20th century when the US was essentially the center of the global economy, the most mean reverting stable economy of all time. And we're extrapolating and say the future will look like that. In fact, I'm going to dig a hole for historical risk premiums and bury them deep. Even though everybody uses them, they're incredibly noisy numbers. And the noise basically comes from the fact that you have a standard error. It's estimated you need about 250 to 300 years of uninterrupted market history in a market that doesn't change for a historical risk premium to be usable. Good luck with that. I mean, I've seen people go back to 1871 with US stocks. The only problem is that 1871, the US was an emerging market coming out of the Civil War. There is no escape hatch here. It's incredibly noisy. And I think using US premiums puts you at risk because you're taking the most successful equity market of the 20th century, right? That's the US. And then you're saying the future will look just like that for me. That's assuming you can pick the most successful market of the next century. So this use of historical risk premiums for better or worse is getting us into trouble. Now, clearly, if I'm not going to use a historical premium, I have to use something else. I'll come back and give you my alternative. But before I do that, I want to make this problem even more obvious. Today, at least in the US, you have this choice of do I go back 100 years, 150 years, or 75 years? Let's say I to value Vinamilk. Vinamilk is a Vietnamese dairy company, a really good company. If you've never taken a look, take a look at the company. Publicly traded, sells its milk across the world. And you want a Vietnamese 
equity risk premium. You decide to do the only thing you know what to do, which is a computer historical risk premium. I actually had a Vietnamese analyst, values company, and he said, said, can you take a look at my valuation, my first DCF? And he'd done it, everything mechanically right, but the way he got the equity risk premium for Vietnam was by looking at historical returns in Vietnam. How many years of data do you think you're going to have if you take a market like Vietnam? He had like 14 years. Remember, this was a country without an equity market until about 20 years ago. He had 14 years. He'd come up with an equity risk premium of 7%. That sounded on the face of it, not bad, right? So I asked him, could you do me a favor and compute the standard error in this number? Just use that standard error function in Excel on the 14 numbers. He came back to me and said it was 9.35%. I say, okay, think about what you've told me, that the equity risk premium is 7%. And this isn't even two standard deviations. One standard error, it could be minus 2% or 16%. Forget about two standard errors. But with most countries, you don't even have the historical data you have in the U.S. So this is a bit of a problem, right? Because you've got to value Brazilian companies. So I'm going to give you the opening that I'm going to stick with in thinking about country risk. I'm going to start with the U.S. premium, because at least here you have the luxury of history. Not because I'm being parochial, but because I want to start with the base. And then I'm going to say, if I know what that base is and I can come to you as a country, let's say Vietnam, you can help me out here. If my U.S. equity risk premium is, let's say, 5%, and I'm looking at Vietnam, would you expect the equity risk premium for Vietnam to be higher than 5% or lower than 5%? Higher because it's a riskier market, right? It becomes then a question of how do we measure that extra premium? It makes our problem more manageable because we're focusing on having a base and, and adding on top. So I'll take you through a pathway of three different ways in which you can get that additional premium for a Brazil, a Vietnam, and India, and Indonesia. The first is a very lazy way. It draws on a number we've already used to get risk-free rates. Remember to get a risk-free rate in Indian rupees, what I did, I started with the government bond rate, and I subtracted out the default spread for India. And I told you then I was going to do this because I did not want to double count risk. I'll explain how the double counting plays out. Most investment banks, the way they get equity risk premiums for emerging markets, they start with the US premium, often a made up number or a number from some service. And then they add the default spread to that country to come up with the equity risk premium for the country. So if you look at an the Brazil example that we worked through, where we came up with three different premiums based on whether you looked at the sovereign CDS spread or the rating or the government bond, Let's say you take the 3.68% the from the rating approach. To get an equity risk premium for Brazil, I start with the US premium, 5.94%. I'll talk about where I get that base premium and I add on that extra default spread. Now, do you see what the double counting would kick in? If I'd left the government bond rate as is intact with that default spread built in and I push up the equity risk premium for the same default spread, I'm punishing this company twice. So when I first started looking at equity risk premium for countries, this was the state of the art, if you can call it that. Take the US premium, add the default spread, let's move on. So countries with high default spreads will also have high equity risk premiums. But it's a little, I mean, you're using a default spread on a government bond as your additional premium for an equity market, right? It sounds like it's a mismatch. So I'm going to give you a second approach. This is an approach that Goldman, I think, developed. Don't let the name lead you to believe that somehow it's going to work better. It was a Goldman approach. And here's what they did. They said, let's not even look at the bond market. Let's focus on equities. We've got the U.S. equity risk premium that goes with the U.S. market. Let's say I want to get an equity risk premium for Brazil. What if I look up the standard deviation in Brazilian equities? which leaves you a practical question, what, what are we using? Let's use the Bovespa, terribly constructed index, perhaps the worst constructed index I've ever seen because it's a trade-weighted index. You know what trade weighting is? The more a stock is traded, the larger the weight in the index. It's got nothing to do with market cap. But it's constructed that's, that way. And once an index gets constructed badly, you can't deconstruct it, right? Because you have a history that you can't run away from. But it's still widely used as the index for Brazil. 
What if I gave you two numbers? One was the standard deviation of the Bovespa, let's say it's 30%, and the other was the standard deviation, the S&P 500, about 18%. I looked at a two-year standard deviation, you can pull it off Bloomberg. So basically I look, remember those algebra problems we used to do in sixth to seventh grade? The US has 18% standard deviation, you are demanding a 5.94% equity risk premium. Brazil has a 30% standard deviation. What's the question I'm asking? What premium would you demand? I'm going to scale up the 5.94% for the, it's, it, basically I'm scaling up for relative equity market volatility. I come up with 9.9% as my total equity risk premium for Brazil. And if you ask me to decompose it, 3.96%, the difference between that and my US premium is the additional premium I'm charging for Brazil. So this looks pretty good, right? Much better than using the government bond, but it rests on equity market volatilities. So when, when Goldman came up with this, I said, okay, let me do this for every market in the world. It's not difficult to get volatilities. And I discovered the Egyptian market should have an equity risk premium of like 1%. You know why? Because its standard deviation is like five or 6%. Think about it. What drives standard deviation? The riskiness of the market, but for it to show up in standard deviation, the price has to change. And for the price has to change, what has to happen? People have to trade illiquid markets. Costa Rica has like four and a half percent standard deviation. I still remember a Wall Street Journal article I read a long time ago about the Egyptian market and how trades were recorded. You know how they were recorded? There was a guy with a chalkboard. I'm not kidding you who stood in front of the exchange and every time a trade happened, he would write the trade in chalk on the board and he wouldn't fill up the board by the end of the day. If you have an illiquid market, your standard deviation is going to converge on zero. There are about 40 countries where if you use this approach, all of Africa looks very safe to me. <laughs> but nobody trades in, I, I guess, parts of Africa. It shows up as Ivory Coast, go buy those stocks. I must be really safe. This approach is fatal flaws. You're comparing markets with different liquidity. More liquid markets are going to look riskier than less liquid markets. You bring in liquidity effect. So about 20 plus years ago, I decided to kind of split the difference. I said, look, I cannot compare markets in the US and Brazil because of different liquidity, but maybe I can compare markets within Brazil. So I went to the first approach and I looked up the default spread. Remember 3.68%? And I looked up two standard deviations, just like the second approach. But here are the standard deviations I looked up were the standard deviation, the Bovespa Brazilian equity, and the standard deviation in the Brazilian government bond. Like a similar algebra problem. But the assumption I'm making is if one is illiquid, the other is going to be illiquid as well. And I looked at the ratio. Brazilian equities are about one and a half times more volatile than Brazilian government bonds. Remember that default spread of 3.68% of charge for the bond? I scaled it up to reflect the, the fact that equities are one and a half times riskier. I come up with 5.52%. The equity risk premium, I call this my melded approach because I'm stealing from both approaches to come up with the risk premium of 11.46% for Brazil. Sorry, Professor. Um, the slides is not being shown on Zoom or the full front line. Let's see. Thank you for letting me know. So. Okay, now it should, right? You can see the yep. slide now? Yeah, yeah, okay. thank you. So I have three different versions of the equity risk frame, one coming from the default spread, one coming from looking at relative equity market volume, the third approach. Will they give you different numbers? Obviously, you got to hang your hat on one or the other, right? So if you want to go the old fashioned way, the default spreads, I'm okay with that if that's what you do for every country. If you want to go the relative equity market volatility approach, be very careful because you're going to get some strange looking equity risk premiums for parts of the world. If you're okay with it, you can go along. I'm not okay with it, but you know that's your choice. The third approach is my preferred approach. And it's in fact, the approach I use at the start of every year to get equity risk premiums for every market in the world. Now, some of you might've got the link that I sent yesterday about my most recent data post on country risk. 
And essentially, the point I was trying to make is you can't hide from country risk anymore. When I first started teaching this class, a big chunk of the class was going to work in New York for New York investment banks looking at U.S. companies. This is 1986. And their reaction is, why are we talking about country risk? Let's say some of you are planning to work in New York on just U.S. companies. Do you still have to think about country risk? Let's say you're looking at Coca-Cola. Do you think you're immune from country risk because the company's incorporated in the U.S. and its headquarters in Atlanta? It gets 40% of its revenues from emerging markets. Welcome to globalization. You go to work for Mumbai, you, don't, you work with an Indian company, let's say, you know, Bharti Airtel, got significant investments in Africa. Everybody needs to have a template, at least, for thinking about country risk. So this is purely selfish. So 25 years ago, I said, I need these numbers when I value companies. So I'm going to estimate equity risk premiums by country. So I'll take you through the start of 2023 so you can see exactly where the numbers come from. I start with the base premium for the US. I'll come back and talk about where the 5.94% comes from. It's not a historical premium. It's an updated, forward-looking premium. I'll go through that process. Then I look up the sovereign ratings for every country that I can find a rating for. Moody's rated 151 countries last year. So I have 151 countries for which I have a rating. S&P pretty much has the overlap. For those countries, if you have a AAA rating, you made my life easy. I'm going to give you the same premium that I estimated for the US. I know it's lazy, but here's the assumption I'm making. If you're AAA rated, you're a mature market and mature markets need to share a premium. You can't have 10 mature markets with different premiums because money is going to flow across. So every country with a AAA rating will get a 5.94% premium. If you're not AAA rated, then I'm going to go find a default spread that goes with your rating. For those countries where there's a sovereign CDS, I can use that. But if I don't have that, I'm going to go with the rating based spread. And then I'm going to multiply it and rather than using each country's government bond and equity to get a ratio, I use one ratio. And I'll tell you why. There are only about 40 countries, remember, that had government bonds. Only about seven or eight of those are liquid. So trying to get government bond standard deviations on a country-to-country -country basis, I'm going to tear my hair up. So here's how I cheated. I looked up two standard deviations. One is a standard deviation. These are both S&P indices of an emerging market equity index. The second is a standard deviation in, in an S&P public bond, emerging market public bond index. So that ratio looks across emerging markets. That ratio is 1.41 at the start of 2023. So here's how it will play out. If your default spread is 2%, I'm going to multiply the 2% by 1.41. That gives me 2.82%. And then I'm going to add that on to the 5.94% equity risk premium that I have for the US to come up with an equity risk premium for your country. And I'm going to do this for every country for which I can get a rating. Yes? When you find the CDS spread, can you also remove the like, transaction costs? That's, I remove the US portion of it. I use the net spread. So when you look at my equity risk premium page, that's a number that you'll see playing out. It'll be 3.2% for Brazil once I net that out. But that's basically what I would use. Exactly. In fact, that's my suggestion. Whatever you chose to do in the risk free rate, stick with it here it's going to even out. You see what I mean by that? Use too big a spread there, you're going to lower the risk free rate too much, but you're going to increase the equity risk premium proportionately. Yes? So what's different about the market volatility in your Cathy Asia versus on the Golden model is that you're calculating the relative market volatility versus the emerging market board. I'm, or, I'm basically staying within a market. The assumption being liquidity is more likely to be comparable if I'm looking at stocks and bonds within a market than if I compare across markets. Right. So if I compare the Pakistani equity market to the Pakistan government bond, they're both illiquid. They both will have low standard deviations. If I compare Pakistani equities to U.S. equities, I'm going to get a very strange result because I'm comparing an, an illiquid market to a liquid market. Okay. So here's what the world looked like to me at the start of 2023. So essentially, I've broken down countries geographically. And don't jump down my throat about putting your country in the wrong geography. You know how many emails I get from people saying, how dare you put us in Eastern Europe and Russia? Where are West Europe? And especially Hungarians, Polish. This is all I spend my first two weeks on. And uh, 
So whatever it is, move it. If you want to move it, go ahead and move it. I really don't care. This is really just so I can fit it all into one page. But there are a couple of things to notice about this. The 5.94% that you see showing up for the US, Canada, Germany, Singapore, Australia, the Netherlands, you know what they share in common, right? They're all AAA rated countries. If you're not AAA rated, the red number will tell you the additional risk premium that reflects the default spread times 1.41. So that's a total country risk premium. You add the red number to the 5.94%, you're going to come up with the equity risk premium by country. So let's take Latin America. The safest country in Latin America? This has been true for probably the last 20 years. It's Chile. It's riskier than it used to be, but it still stays the safest country. But Latin America is a mess. I mean, you can look at Venezuela, 30.63%. And even at 30.63%, you're probably terrified. This is a dollar equity risk premium, but you can see the differences across. When I started doing this, I did not expect a single person other than myself to be using these equity risk premiums. But this is now the most downloaded data set on my website by far. It gets used in the strangest places. I have absolutely no control in how it's used. So I've kind of given up on it. I remember for, you know, I can keep track of geographically where people are coming on to my website. So I remember when, one month I was checking and a lot of Lithuanians were coming on. I said, what the heck is happening here? How am I so popular in Lithuania? It turned out that for a while, Lithuanian, the Lithuanian government, when it was considering privatization proposals, required people to use my equity risk premium. I didn't get any commissions from this. Or no, no. But I said, OK, good. I'm, I'm being used in Lithuania. I remember getting an email from the New Zealand Milk Board. Never know if there's a milk board about, no, how do you do those risk premiums? But here's my admission. There's no intellectual firepower behind these numbers, right? It's not like I'm researching Venezuela deeply. I'm starting with default spreads and building up. That's its weakest link. Because the default spreads are either wrong or don't reflect the equity risk appropriately in the country. You're probably going to misstate the equity risk. I'll give you an example. Take a look at Saudi Arabia. Why is the equity risk premium so low? Because there's very little default risk. Why is default risk so low? When you have cash coming out of you know, the oil and you don't have to borrow money, nobody's worried about it. But if you're investing in equities in Saudi Arabia, I would argue that there are risks you worry about, right? Political risk, upheaval risk, that's not in the default spread. So I'm fully aware that by looking at default spread as my starting point, I might be missing pieces of the puzzle. But here's the one thing it has going for it. I do exactly the same thing over and over again. It's got that element of consistency, at least. There's no bias here. I don't sit there saying, I like Venezuela a lot. You know, Maybe I should lower the risk premium. No, I'd really let the numbers play through. Incidentally, one recent add-on is if you look at the very top right-hand corner of the page, you'll notice that there are equity risk premiums for about 15 countries. And you can take a, read down the list. You can already see that these are not exactly the countries we are running into invest in. Syria, no. North Korea. Any of you lining up to go into North Korea? And until about five years ago, I didn't have a risk premium for them because there was no rating, no default spread, nothing. So starting about five, six, maybe 2015 or 16, here's how I started estimating equity risk premiums for them. The services that measure risk, country risk scores. They don't do it for default risk. They just come up with country. One of the, serve, one of the services I use called political risk services. They come up with a numerical country risk score for countries. The scores go from low to high. Lower, very risky countries. Higher, very safe countries. Switzerland was the safest country in the world to invest in last year. Probably no surprise. I know Syria might have been the most risky part of the world to invest. So I look up these scores for these 15 countries for which there's no rating. Then I cheat. Here's what I do. I go look for other countries with similar scores. So if you have a score of 38, I look for other countries with scores between 35 and 40. And then maybe two of those countries have a rating and an equity risk premium. Guess what I do? I average that, I attach it to you, and I move on. 
simplistic, guilty as charged. But if you have a better way of estimating equity risk premiums for North Korea, I'd love to know what it is. And if your business is heavily half in Syria, half in North Korea, North Korea, God help you, but at least I can give you an equity risk premium number. I can't do much more than that. But no matter where you operate in the world now, at least I can say this is the premium you should be demanding for being in that part of the world. So any questions on country equity risk premiums? Because now I want to go from equity risk premiums for countries to estimating them for companies. Yes. How uh, regularly do you do the practical or necessary updates? I do it twice a year, right? And usually you don't have to do much more. If you want to update them every month, you actually have a basis, at least the base premium for the US update every month. So you can actually, so it's, if you go to the spreadsheet, the starting number is the US premium. And if you want to make it, the rest of the premiums are a function of whether default spreads change and ratings change. Ratings don't change very often. Maybe like, you know, you'd probably be underestimating the equity risk premium for Russia in 2021 if you use the start of the year because in my March or April, the whole thing was coming apart. But that's something that, that you have to think about. If you're investing in a country where something massive has happened, go get the sovereign CDS spread. The, what I do is, is, kind of, is not, replace my default spread with your sovereign CDS spread. So Sri Lanka, for instance, when it went to hell in a handbasket last year, that's what I told people, look, I can't be updating. Now, I'm not a data service. I can't be updating this once every month. But the metrics I use are pretty straightforward. So for most countries, it won't change dramatically. But for a year like last year, where default spreads rose over the course of the year, my mid-year equity risk premiums for countries was vastly higher than the start of the year. So let's talk about how this plays out in companies. Yes. That's a, that, that is, they are US dollar premiums because the markets are US dollar markets, right? The CDS market is a dollar, which creates a currency inconsistency, right? One way you can get around this is to get an equity risk premium in dollars, then scale it up for inflation. It's very simple, basically, because the only reason it should be different if you're doing things in rupees is this is on top of your risk-free rate. So already your risk-free rate will be much higher if you have a high inflation currency, and then you can scale up the premium even more to reflect the fact that you have 30% inflation to 3%. It's as simple as multiplying your equity risk premium by 1.30 divided by 1.03, the differential inflation. And you can adjust the premium for different inflations. Because risk free rate takes care of itself because that's, you know, because I can value an Indian company in dollars, I can value it in rupees. So this is the way you preserve consistency. Otherwise you're gonna be all over the place if you're using default spreads and risk premiums that are inconsistent across currencies. So now let's talk about how this plays out with individual companies. Let's start with the lazy way of doing this, which is what a lot of analysts seem to still follow. You look at where a company's incorporated, what country it's incorporated, and give it the equity risk premium for that country. So you know what's going to happen here, right? Every Indian company will get the Indian equity risk premium. Every U.S. company will get the U.S. equity risk premium. And to me, this is a recipe for disaster. Why? Because you can have an Indian company that gets 90% of its revenues in the U.S. and a U.S. company that gets 90% of its revenues in Nigeria. Or you can take a South African company, and South African companies actually did this. Delist in Johannesburg and relist in London. And there were actually analysts who said, oh, your premium went down to the UK premium. What did you do? Bring your gold mines with you from South Africa and stick them in the middle of Lancashire? It's, it makes absolutely no sense. But it's amazing how much of traditional valuation still takes it where you incorporated. End of story. Let me add your risk premium. It's almost nonsensical. The second approach is to say, look, I put in all this work to get to a beta. I'm not going to waste it. I'm going to bring the equity risk premium into that beta calculation. And this equity risk premium can be either a local premium or a weighted average of where you operate and multiply by basically you're assuming that beta measures your exposure to all other risk, just as much as, uh, to country risk as much as it measures to all other risk. And the third approach, you treat country risk as a separate beast in itself. You're saying there's a country risk premium, 
but a company's exposure to that risk is going to be dependent on the company. And we'll talk about some of the factors that make some companies more exposed to country risk than others. But the central question here is, how the heck do you come up with that country risk premium? As I said, the lazy way is say, tell me we're incorporated, I'll give you that risk premium. But for the longest time I've been pushing this and I'm having some traction, but not enough in my view that ultimately a company's exposure to country risk comes from where it does business. You think, what do you mean where it does business? Well, where it makes its stuff, where it sells its stuff, where its distribution centers are located. seems like the common sense thing to do. We can debate practically how to measure that, but that is my starting point. So let's take an example of how I would compute equity risk premiums for multinational companies. The first is uh, from 2004, I was doing a valuation of Embraer. Embraer is a Brazilian aerospace company, gets most of its revenues. In fact, in 2004, 97% of its revenues in North America and Western Europe, not even Asia, just those two. In fact, if you compare how much of Embraer's revenues come from North America and, and Western Europe to Boeing's breakdown, it's exactly the same. But Embraer happens to be a Brazil-based company. Rather than use the Brazilian equity risk premium, I used a weighted average of Brazil's risk premium, which is huge, 3%, and the remaining 97% came from developed markets. So I gave it a mature market premium. I was treating Embraer as the equivalent pretty much of a US company. Now, there is a problem with what I'm doing, right? Where does Embraer make its aircraft though? In Brazil. By focusing entirely on revenues, you can say I'm missing that risk. So I'll come back and talk about that. This is, I'll talk about why I use revenues as my starting point. It's not because I love revenues, it's because desperation drives me there. You know what I mean by desperation? Most companies, in fact, Almost every company I look at will break revenues down geographically. But try, and you can check with your company, very few companies break, break down the production geographically or any other metric geographically. So sometimes use revenues because you have no other choice. But there is that danger of missing some risk. If you take Embev, another Brazil-based beverage company, and this is in 2012, their revenues by 2012 were coming from all over Latin America. It's a Brazilian company, but guess what? It's jumping out of the frying pan into the fire because it's going into riskier Latin American markets that's affecting its equity risk premium. And if you look at a company like Coca-Cola, sorry, you're really, I mean, all bets are off because it's a US incorporated company, but it gets its revenues from all over the world. Notice I've given up on countries here. It's by region. Coca-Cola actually doesn't break its revenues down by country, and who can blame them? It'll be like 72 countries in the list. They break them down by regions. And if you go back a couple of pages and look at the map that I showed you for the world, notice that there's a regional average that I report for each part of the world. The reason I report that is I need it for companies like Coca-Cola, which break revenues down regionally. You know how I get the regional average for Asia and Latin America? I don't use a simple average. Why? Because I don't want to weight Myanmar as much as I weight China in Asia. Clearly, the company says we're in China, they're not getting equal revenues. So I weight it based on GDP. It's the simplest metric I could think of. So Asia is going to be heavily weighted towards China and Japan. And that makes sense because you're in Asia, that's the market, and increasingly India. Latin America is going to be heavily weighted towards Brazil. But those regional averages are what I use when I, when I compute the equity risk premium for a Coca-Cola is how much you get per region. Now I'll caution you, when you look up these numbers for your company, you're gonna get frustrated because companies are horrifically bad about how they break down their revenues. You know a typical US company breaks its revenues down into? 71% of our revenues come from the US, 29% from the rest of the world. Come on, guys. The rest of the world is a really big place. Can we start to get a little more specific? This is my problem with accounting disclosure. 
they're asking companies to disclose all this crap I couldn't care less about. Could we start by having a way of describe of explain of no at least describing where your revenues come from that I can use in valuation? European companies have a different problem. They actually break their revenues down into Europe and other, and one of the reasons they report is EMEA. What? What, what is EM? Oh, it's a Middle East and Africa. What the heck are you doing bundling them all into one place? I'm not even sure they go together. But beggars can't be choosers. You're stuck with what you have. Don't try to fight the data saying, I want more. There isn't more, no more. You got to take what you can. But the revenue focus can be a little troubling. Now, I understand it. I wish I could do more. And you could argue that maybe I need to bring in the other factors. Where are your factors? The second is, should I be multiplying this by beta or not? In other words, once I get this risk premium, should I just add it on as a constant? Should I scale it up? Are riskier companies in risky markets doubling up their risk because you're taking a risky market and you have a discretionary product? So those are questions that can be examined. I'm willing to open the debate. In fact, I think it's worth debating. Should we be looking at things other than revenues? So let's take an example where revenues clearly should not be used. 2015, I had to value Royal Dutch. I didn't have to. I, want, I decided to value Royal Dutch. Now think of, an, think of an oil company, right? You extract oil. Where do your revenues come from? They come from a global oil market. You sell it in the market. Your risk as an oil company doesn't come from where you sell the oil. It comes from where you extract the oil. And guess what? When God decided to put oil on the world, he decided that either by giving oil, you're going to make that part of the world really risky, or you take the riskiest parts of the world and put it there. You don't have any oil in Switzerland. You have a lot of it in Nigeria and Kazakhstan and wherever else you got to go look for it. And the nice thing about oil companies is they do tell you where they get their oil. This is from Royal Dutch's financial statement. So I didn't need any private information sources. Right out of its annual report, they tell you where the oil and gas is produced. And I took a weighted average of the equity risk premiums of where they got their oil. The equity risk premium I ended up for Royal Dutch looked like that of an emerging market company. Royal Dutch on the face of it. Looks like a UK or a Dutch company. It's got this dual personality. But in reality, it's an emerging market company listed in London or in the Netherlands, depending on where you look at it. Yes? How did that work the diversification of risk? It wouldn't matter, right? Because as remember, the only risk we price in is the risk you cannot diversify away. So you diversifying does nothing for me as a marginal investor who's diversifying. I mean, say it's all up for two packages right. uh, versus the 20, because the risk in each one is... Okay, this is the McKinsey argument. Until the 1980s, McKinsey used to argue that companies should not add premiums for being in risky countries. And they made exactly this argument. It's a diversification argument. If you're in 100 countries, things will average out. The 1980s, they were actually right. The only problem is that argument rests on the premise that countries what happens in countries is uncorrelated, right? Or lightly correlated. Guess what? Globalization has screwed that up for us too. You look at 2020, the first quarter, every market in the world is down at the same time. In periods you worry most about risk, which is crisis periods, markets tend to move almost in tandem. So practically I can see the argument, but if you look at the numbers, it just doesn't add up anymore. So maybe in the 1980s, you could get away as Coca-Cola did using 12% cost of capital everywhere in the world. I hope they're not doing it anymore. It just doesn't make sense. Okay. So you can use revenue weights. You can use production. Can you use a mix of the two? What if you have an automobile company? Right, the reason oil companies and natural resource companies are kind of locked into country risk is you have no choice, right? The country goes to hell in a handbasket. There's nothing you can do. But if you're a manufacturing company, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. So if, if any of you say, look, can I weight production 60% and revenues 40%? Absolutely. 
I think it's a choice you have to make. And it's a healthy discussion to have. Where does the risk in my company come from? So that's the second approach, basically, is you, is you try to bring it all into a weighted average equity risk premium. There's a third approach where you focus very closely on country risk. And this is an approach I would use very rarely. It's for a company where country risk is front and center. Like what? Like the Adani Group. Let's face it, whether you, whatever you think about the Adani Group, they're tied at the hip to the India story. Why they're an infrastructure company in a country where infrastructure is the key ingredient needed for the country to make it into the growth story it wants to be. So you could argue that maybe I should be looking at all of the elements that look at it. And here are some of the things to look at. One is, you know, does, a does the company use any kind of risk management products to protect itself against country risk? You can buy insurance against certain kinds of political risk. It's very expensive. But more critically, is the company viewed as somehow as being in the national interest? God help you if you're a company that's viewed in the national interest because your country risk exposure just went down. Because you know what that means, right? Every time the country is in trouble, it's going to drag the company down with it because you're a national interest company. So what I'm opening up at least is a possibility for some companies, you might worry so much about country risk, such a big part of your story, that you want a more refined measure of how exposed is my company to that country risk. So a few years ago, I'll tell you the history of this particular approach to dealing with country risk. So I think 2003, I was uh, flying to Brazil to do a valuation seminar. And at that time, I was doing what everybody did, Brazilian company, Brazilian country risk. And the two companies I was looking at were Embev, which at that time was 100% Brazilian company, and Embraer, which at that time, as you could see, was what, 3% in Brazil and 97% elsewhere. Long flight, I'm checking through my slides. I get to the slide where I have cost of equity for both companies. I'm giving them both sky high cost of equity. Because in 2003, Brazil was a very risky country. And I said, this is not fair. They're both Brazilian companies, but I would expect Embraer to be less exposed to Brazilian country risk than Embraer. I said, I've got to come up with a way to differentiate across companies. So I concocted a measure called Lambda. Notice the word I use, concocted, not derived, because that's just deep thought. You're on a flight 30,000 feet up. You concoct things. Your kind of mind is not quite there anyway. I concocted a measure called Lambda. Lambda is just like bait. It's scaled around one. Your Lambda one means you're as exposed as the average company in the market to country risk. A Lambda above one means you're more exposed than the typical company. Lambda less than one means you're less exposed. You're saying, why call it Lambda? It's attaching a Greek alphabet, adds a layer of sophistication to almost everything you do. I could have called it L, but you wouldn't have been as impressed, right? Lambda. So I land in Brazil. I fell asleep right after I thought about that land in Brazil. And I throw this idea out. 300 Brazilian people now, in the Brazilians in the room, I say, what do you think of this idea that different? And they all like the idea. Then one of the more pragmatic people in the audience says, how do you propose to measure Lambda? I said, I haven't thought about that yet, but I have a long flight back. <laughs> and I did have a long flight back and actually wrote an entire paper. This is one of the great things about flights before you had Wi-Fi on flights. You have nothing to do other than eat, drink, and watch terrible movies. So I said, I better use. So it's actually on my website. I'll send you the link for it on estimating company risk exposure to country risk. I talk about what are the things I would love to know about a company things I would like to ask them. And then I came up with different ways of estimating Lambda. I'll start with the most simplistic. You tell me what percentage of your revenues you get from the domestic market, the market I'm worried about. If I know what the average company in that country is getting as revenues from that country, I have a way of scaling your revenue. So as an example, take two Indian companies, Tata Motors and Tata Consulting Services, both Indian companies, both part of the same family group. Tata Motors was getting 91% of its revenues in 2008-2009 from India. Tata Consulting Services was getting about 8%. Very simplistic. Here's what I did. I divided each of those numbers by what the average Indian company was getting in India, 80%. What does that give me? It, it gives me a lambda 1.14 for Tata Motors, suggesting it's more risky than the average Indian company, more exposed to Indian country risk, and 0.09 for data consulting service. Simplistic, but have a lambda. 
In fact, in 2009, Tata Motors did something that brought their Lambda down pretty significantly. You know what it did? It acquired Jaguar Land Rover. The minute they acquired Jaguar Land Rover, you've essentially bought exposure in global markets. It brings your Lambda down. So it's simplistic, but it gives you at least a starting point for Lambdas. But it's still based on revenues, right? So through the paper, I wrestled with what can I use? I tried earnings. Terrible, right? Accountants smooth things out. It's very difficult to get a measure of what's. So I latch on to the approach that I think offers the most promise if you go, want to go down this route. And as I said, I rarely go down this route. A little later in this class, we're going to talk about betas. You've seen betas in prior classes. How do we estimate the beta for a company? What do we do? We run a regression of what against what? Returns on the stock against returns on an equity market index. The slope of the line is the beta. Why? Because it measures how much my stock is affected by movements in the overall equity market. What's the question I'm asking with Lambda is how much is my company affected by changes in country risk, right? So I said, if I can find something that moves just because of country risk, and I run a regression of returns on my stock against that, maybe I can get a sense of what does the market think about my company's exposure to country risk? In 2004, Here's what I used. I used what was called the C bond, which is a Brazilian dollar denominated bond. So it's a dollar denominated bond, so there's no currency effect. So what's causing that bond to go up and down in value? Swings in the risk of Brazil. It's all driven by default risk. And I ran a regression of Embraer versus the C bond and Embratel, which was, in a sense, the most country based company I could find in Brazil because it's a phone company in Brazil, gets 100% of its revenues in Brazil. Remember, if my company is very exposed to country risk, you should expect to see a high slope. If it's unaffected, you should see a slope of zero. Maybe it'll actually go in the opposite direction. I've never seen that happen. Maybe that can happen too. So think of it like a beta, but I'm trying to measure exposure to just country risk. Let me cut to the chase. When I ran the regression, if I looked at Embraer, the slope I got was 0.27. For every 1% move in the C bond, Embraer moved only 0.27. The market hit Embraer, but not very much. In contrast, if you look at the Embratel regression, for every 1% move in the market, Embratel moved 2%. Supremely exposed to Indian country risk. So if any of you are interested in saying, hey, is there a way I can test to see how much the Adani group is exposed to Indian country risk? Here's my suggestion. India doesn't have dollar denominated bonds, but it has sovereign CDS spreads. Take the returns in the Adani group, run it against the sovereign CDS spread. And if your thesis is right, when the CDS spread moves up and down, you should see Adani's returns reflected as well. It's a lot. Whoever's got their mic open, could you just mute yourself? So when you try to estimate exposure to country risk, this is the most time consuming. And you can see why I would never use it for a multinational that's in nine countries or 11 countries, or God help me, Coca-Cola with 72 countries. You know what I'd have to do, right? Estimate lamb designates each of the countries. And I have more stuff to do in my valuation. This is not where I want to fight my fight. So 95% of my companies, I'm going to use the weighted equity risk premium approach in spite of all of its limitations and move on. But if you have a company that's singularly exposed to one country and you want to focus deeper on that connection, think of the Lambda route. Even if you decide not to route it, at least get a sense of how dependent am I on country risk when I value this company. So will these different ways of thinking about risk yield very different numbers? Let's think about the broad choices. You can go with Brazil as a Brazilian, I mean, Embraer is a Brazilian company, treated as a purely Brazilian company. And if you do that, you're going to end up with high cost of equity. Why? Because you're going to get the entire, so when you see the 17.24 and 17.79%, those are approaches where I punish Embraer for being a Brazilian company, give it all of the risk of Brazil. The other three approaches, the only variants are, am I multiplying by a beta, a lambda, but they all give you roughly you know, similar numbers, right? Nine to 11%, but you get two divergent set of numbers. If you treat Embraer as a Brazilian company, you get much higher cost of equity. 
If you treat Embraer as a company based on where its operations are, you get much lower cost of equity. What does that mean for valuation? If I treat it as a Brazilian company and give it the entire Brazilian country risk, I'm going to have higher discount rates and a lower value. If I treat it as a company based on where it does business, I'm going to use low. So don't let the differences within each approach kind of drive you. It's really about, hey, which way do I want to think about cost of equity? And you're going to get very different valuations. Now, I made the argument that operations-based equity risk premiums make more sense, right? So if, if you believe me, then I'm saying 9 to 11% makes a lot more sense than 17 to 18%. But let's say the rest of the world doesn't agree with me and perhaps with you. Everybody else is using 18% as the discount rate to value companies. It's not right, but they're the ones pricing stocks. So here's my question. If you believe that they're wrong in doing that and you decide to invest based on that, you're going to be buying a lot of Embraer and a lot of Infosys and a lot of Vinamilk because these are companies that will be pushed down in value because people are using too high a discount rate. But how do you make money? You could be right and go bankrupt being right, right? So eventually there's got to be a moment of reckoning where people say, oh my God, I didn't realize Embraer was much safer company. Without it, you're kind of going to constantly be wrong. So what do you think brings this moment? What is this reality check? Atlas in the market, whereas India or Brazil is protected, and then there's liquidation. And then the next three days later, and Briar reports its earnings reports, and they're coming out well. And you say, how the heck did that happen? Brazil is going through this catastrophic internal risk and embryo, that's exactly what you're looking for. You're looking for reality to eventually come up. You might have to wait a while for that to happen. I'll tell you what, what, what I find, what, you know, I've, I've done this over the last 25 years. One of the strategies I've adopted is first identify companies like Infosys, like there's one or two companies in every market, perhaps more, which have these characteristics, which are listed in emerging market, get 70, 80% of the revenues in a developed market. Be careful. Don't look for just overseas revenues, because as I said, a Brazilian company, the 80% of its revenues in Venezuela is crude. Right? It's not, it's actually increasing risk. Make a list of those companies, don't do anything. Wait for a crisis. You think, what if it doesn't come? You're talking about an emerging market. It's not a question of whether there'll be a crisis, it's a question of when there'll be a crisis, right? In a crisis, what happens? People sell everything, especially foreign institutional investors who are the biggest sheep on the face of the earth, right? They're not even looking at the stock, they're looking at each other. They all flee the market at the same time. They sell the good stuff, the bad stuff. That's your chance. They pull out your list. Next time that market is in a crisis, take the two companies. Vietnam is in a crisis, buy Vinamilk. You don't even have to do a valuation. Just buy it on the presumption that people are going to sell it indiscriminately. This is not an investment philosophies class, but it's a class about taking advantage of market mistakes. And this is, I think, a mistake that markets make is get too caught up in incorporation and where a company is located rather than where it does business. Yes. Which most of those risks are cash flow risks, right? Because if you're a company that, you know, you're in the, the regulatory risks are actually more in the safest parts of the world, parts like the EU, right? Huge amounts of regular, but they show up as costs. So your margins tend to be lower, your cash flows will be lower. There's no need to adjust the discount rate. You know, the way I describe discount rates is don't make them the receptacles for all your hopes and fears. I see too many analysts saying, how do I pump up? When in fact, many of the things you worry about are cash flow effects, right? If you have a capricious regulator who basically changes, that's different, right? But to the extent that regulation causes costs, build them in lower margins, lower cash flows, no need to adjust your discount rate for that. Okay. So now let me open the door to a different way of thinking about equity risk premiums. Because all of this talk of country risk premiums was built on a US premium, right? And I told you the historical premium approach doesn't work for me. So I'm going to build up an implied premium using the example that I started the class with, which is 
that when you show me what you pay for something, whether you like it or not, you're telling me what you expect to earn as a return. And I can reverse engineer from that what your risk premium should be. We do this in the bond market all the time, right? We call it a yield to maturity on a bond. What's a yield to maturity on a bond? Takes the price of the bond, takes the cash flows in the bond. You solve for that discount rate that makes the present value of your cash flows equal to the price of the bond. I'm going to do something similar with the stock market. And I'll go back to the start of 2020 to get this, th this ball rolling. And I'm deliberately picking the start of 2020 because I want to make a point about dynamic equity risk premiums. January 1st, 2020, I'll make a confession. I saw nothing coming. I didn't see a virus. I didn't see COVID. So no conspiracy-minded people here. So you know, I, I none of that was on, my, on the horizon. So I computed an implied equity risk premium for the S&P 500. Sounds fancy. But here's what I did. I looked at what people were paying for the index. 3,320. And I said, okay, that's, I know what they pay, 3,000. So that's what you're paying for stocks, the 500 largest market cap stocks. Unlike a bond, you're not going to get coupons and face value. You expect or hope and pray you'll get cash flows from the stock. They can take one of two forms. They can take the form of dividends, the old fashioned way companies used to return cash or buybacks. Unlike a coupon, that number is not fixed, but I can tell you what it was in the most recent year. It was 150.5. I can even tell you what analysts collectively are expecting it to grow by for the next five years. The S&P 500 is the most tracked and followed index in the world. At the start of 20, 2020, their projections for growth were about 4% a year. So here's what I did. I took the cash flows, grew them at 4% a year for the next five years. You're saying, what happens after year five? Well, remember, these are the 500 largest market cap stocks in the U.S. They can't keep growing at a rate faster than the U.S. economy or profits are going to exceed the economy, which is an impossible scenario. So starting in year five, I push the growth rate to the growth rate of the economy. Now, you're going to see me do this over and over again in valuation. But whenever I'm asked to estimate the nominal growth rate in the economy for the long term, I've discovered the best predictor is not some macroeconomist forecast, but the T-bond rate. And the T-bond rate at the start of 2020 was 1.92%. So basically, I have cash flows growing at 3.46% for the next five years, 1.92% beyond. I set up the equation. I know what you paid. There are my cash flows. I saw... For, it's like an internal rate of return for stocks, like a yield. Think of it as a yield to maturity for stocks. And that expected return at the start of 2020 was 7.12%. What does that mean? If you bought US stocks at the start of 2020, I don't care what you hoped you would make, what you prayed you would make, what you thought you would make, given what you paid for those stocks, you can expect to make 7.12% a year. I'm almost there. You subtract out the 1.92%, T-bond rate, my equity risk premium on January 1st, 2020 was 5.20%. All through January 2020, when I was valuing companies, that was my equity risk premium for the US. Saying what happens on February 1st? Not much, but things started happening on February 14th. Those of you who don't remember that day, that was the day the Italian government found 200 people in Italy who had never been to China or on a cruise ship with COVID. We woke up to a nightmare, right? Remember what we said, shock hits. The only thing you have to adjust is prices. It's not like cash flows are gonna change overnight. So starting on February 14th, I actually started estimating the equity risk premium every day. See so how much can happen in a day? A lot in a period like this. The equity risk premium was about 4.7% at this on February 14th. By March 23rd, it had reached almost 8%. March 23rd was the absolute bottom of that crisis. You go back and read the news stories from the day, the world was ending. You know, head for the, you know, go live in a cave. It faded. In fact, one of the differences between this crisis, the COVID crisis and the previous crisis, how quickly the fear faded. By September, you are back to where you were at the start of the year. But the companies I was valuing in March, I had to use the 8% equity risk premium. Otherwise, I would be asking the wrong question. You know, is this stock undervalued? Or I'll be bringing in a market view. Implied equity risk premiums are forward-looking and dynamic. 
They reflect the world you're in, not the world you wished you were in. If you're getting scared, I'll reflect that in your premium. And it's a premium that, as I said, will change over time. And at the start of 2023, the implied equity risk premium, using exactly the same approach I used in 2020, was 5.94%. Now on top of a risk-free rate of 3.88%. So I'm going, going through the exact same process. I do this actually at the start of every month on my website. This premium gets updated. I'll send you the February update. Right now, I think it's 5.48% or 5.5% is the actual premium. But as I said, this is my premium for the stocks I will value in February. March, who knows what March will bring. Forward-looking dynamic premiums. It's not a 2023. I came to you and said the equity risk premium is 5.94%. And your total expected return is 9.82%. You said, well, is that a good premium or a bad premium? You're asking a question about the market itself, right? In fact, you often wonder, is the market overvalued or undervalued? Is it in a bubble or is it busted? You can reframe that question in terms of equity risk premiums. If markets are undervalued, stocks are undervalued, you know what you're telling me about the equity risk premium, right? It's too low. It needs to go up. I'm sorry, it's too high. It needs to go down. If on the other hand, you tell me stocks are overvalued, you tell me the risk premium is too low. I need it to go up. Every statement about the market is really a statement about equity risk premiums. So the start of 2023, what I'm asking you, are you okay with 5.94%? Is that enough of a premium? Admit it. Without perspective, yes, I have no idea. So to fill in perspective, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you what the equity risk premium has looked like going back to 1960. To make a judgment on 5.94%, is it high? Is it low? Is it average? Take a look at the graph. If you go all the way back to 1960, the premium across the period has been about 4.21%. If I compare what I'm getting at the start of 2023, I'm actually getting a much higher premium than what I'd have earned on average. Seeing what the world has changed. If you look at the last 20 years, it's true. The premium would have gone up to 5%. You're still okay, 5.94%. But what about the post-crisis period after 2008? It's true, post-crisis period, 5 point. So almost if I compare to any of those three numbers, I'm feeling okay, right? This is my pushback against bubblers. But we're surrounded by people who keep telling us markets in a bubble. And it might be, it might not be. But I need some tangible basis for that. And the equity risk cream remains like a thermometer that I can use there. Are they right? Because I'll tell you when you should have been worried about the equity risk cream. Take a look at the history, right? There's a 1960s, incredibly stable period. 1970s, something is happening, right? What, else, what is happening in the 70s that's pushing up equity risk creams? Inflation. Remember that inflation historically has been awful, it's pushed. Remember when equity risk premiums go up, stock prices are going down. It's like bond interest rates and bond prices. 70s were an awful period. Great bull market, 78 through 99. But by the end of 99, take a look at what the implied premium in the US was. If I told you you could make 2% more on an expected basis by investing in stocks or post bonds, you'll probably say, I'm not doing that. But people were, right? At the end of 99, they seemed to overlook that with whatever reason. They bought stocks. And of course, you got the dot-com correction. And then you had a period of stability. Then you got the 2008 crisis. This graph gives you the history of US equities. For the last thing, everything's in there. It is my one metric for measuring, hey, am I OK with markets where they are? 5.94%. It's not a bad premium. Now we can debate, are, could, could, is it possible that I've missed Absolutely, my earnings could be wrong, my cash flows could be wrong. But if you take it and convert into a standard error on my implied equity risk premium, the range I would get would be somewhere between 4.8 and 6.5%. If you download the spreadsheet, you can see my range. So with an implied premium, my range is 4.8 to 6.5%. Do you remember what the range was when I used historical premiums? One to nine? Of course I could be wrong. But my chances of being closer to a number are much greater here because I have less to be uncertain about. Now, if you go back a year, the implied equity risk premium that started 2022 was 4.24%. By itself, that's not bad, right? It's higher than the 60-year average. But you know what the big difference was? 
a year ago, that 4.24% was on top of a risk-free rate of 1.51%, my total expected return on stocks last year, because I was building on such a low base, was one of the lowest numbers in history. But you know why we took it? Where else were you going to go? This is what low risk-free rates did for a decade. It said, you have no choice. You got to take 6% returns on stocks. And we did. The cost of equity for US companies dropped to 55 to 6% last year because you really had no choice. But 2022 for me was a return to normalcy, not an abnormal year because we're returning back to expected returns we used to have pre-2008. The collective expected return at the start of 2023 is now back close to 10%, which we haven't seen since 2008. So when people complain about 2022 being a bad year, maybe they should be talking about the 2008 to 2021 as being the strange years that you're coming back from because we accepted returns in stocks so much lower than we perhaps should have because we really had no choice. Couple of final graphs. This is equity risk premiums, the price of risk in the equity market, right? Is there a price of risk in the bond market or what do we call that price of risk? It's a default spread, right? So if I take BAA rated bonds and I look at the default spreads, the default spreads change over time. This graph I've actually taken, the black line is the BAA default, BAA is investment grade bonds. So these are actually pretty safe bonds. Default spreads and bonds versus equity risk premiums. Most of the time, the two move together. Why? Because people panic. They don't just panic in the equity market, they panic everywhere. And most of the time, but there have been two times in the last 25 years where the two markets have diverged. One was in the late 90s. Take a look at the equity risk premiums dropping. That's a dot-com boom. Default spreads are actually staying elevated. In 1999, I could have given you two choices. You could invest in equities collectively and make a 2% spread, or you could buy a BAA rated bond, an investment grade bond, and make a 2% default spread. If we were rational, you know what we should have been doing, right? At the end of 99, taking all our money out of stocks and putting it into a corporate bond because we were getting a better risk re reward trade-off, but we didn't. Then you get to 2001, you get 9-11. And in the year, in the months after 9-11, Alan Greenspan says, I will not let the US economy go into a recession. The hubris of central bankers. And here's what he did. He essentially made the bond market feel that he, it's called the Greenspan put. Basically, he said, I will not let people default. So you can keep lending money and charge too low a spread. And if you look at what's happening in the post-2001 time period, there's the black line. It's dropping off. Default spreads are dropping across the board. Equity risk premiums are staying elevated. You know, people trace 2000, the 2008 crisis to lots of different things. Bank badly behaved bankers, subprime. You know what the common theme across all of them was? 2008 was the first market crisis which was precipitated by what was happening in the bond market. People were lending money, not just to people without credit worthiness, but they were lending it without charging enough of a spread. You can lend to whoever you want if you charge a fair enough rate. And 2008, it caught up with all of them. Take a look at what happened to default spreads in 2008. That was the adjustment, and was it painful? Since then, we're back into sync. 2022, equity risk premiums rose, default spreads rose as well. But I've learned to keep my eyes on the two because when they diverge, something is going on which, which will precipitate a correction. One final graph, and we'll end for the day. That's price of risk and equity, was it? Is there a price of risk in the real estate market? If any, if any of you work in real estate, there's a number called the cap rate. The cap rate is what real estate people use to estimate the price of a property. So if your cap rate is 10%, and if a property with a $1 million rental income, you'll pay 10 million for the property. It's like a cost of equity in real estate. They never call it that, but that's what a cap rate is. If I subtract the risk-free rate from a cap rate, I get the real estate risk premium. 
And if you look at this graph, it looks very weird, right? If, if you look at the 1980s, it looks like the real estate equity risk premium is actually negative. You're saying, well, why would I invest in real estate if I am earning a negative premium? When I did my MBA, you know what the advice we were given was, if you're an investor and you have stocks and bonds, you should try to buy a house. You should invest in real estate. The story was, it moves independently or in the opposite direction as your financial assets, it'll hedge your portfolio. And we listened, we listened too well. And somewhere the process break down, broke down because as you can see, starting in the mid nineties, it looks like real estate is starting to behave like stocks and bonds. So what the heck did we do to real estate to screw it up so much? It was something we celebrated when we did it. We, we securitized it, right? Starting with the 1980s, Lou Ranieri putting out mortgage-backed security. And you know what happens when you securitize an asset class? It starts to behave like a financial asset class. And that's terrible news for all of us because you own a house, you have a lot of money in your pension fund, you own some bonds, you have a bad year on your pension fund. You look at your bond portfolio, it's collapsed as well. You say, thank God I have my house. And you call your realtor and say, what can I sell the house for? Is it 25% less than you did last year? Real estate is no longer acting as a hedge. The reason I do these graphs is we have tunnel vision in markets. If any of you worked in investment banks, you work in equities, all you talk about is equities, right? And even not all equities, your subset of equities. You work in the bond market. We have very few people who can step. The reason in the end of 99, people weren't moving things was they were so stuck in that tunnel vision, they couldn't see what was happening in other markets. And hopefully this can help you get that perspective, look across markets and get a sense of, hey, what is the price of risk in these markets and where do I get the biggest payoff to taking risk? So that's about it. I will see you on Wednesday. Whoever told me about the slides on, on uh, Zoom, thank you for letting me know. <laughs>